So this is Elizabeth Melton. I'm the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Luce Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We are meeting in the Fetzer Institute Conference Room in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Thursday, June 1st, and I am joined by Teresa Smallwood. Uh, Teresa, can you introduce yourself? Thank you so much. I'm Teresa Smallwood. I am a PhD. I work at uh, United Lutheran Seminary. I am the James Franklin Kelly and Hope Eister Kelly Associate Professor of Public Theology. And just prior to that, I was the first uh, what we call fellow uh, postdoc at Vanderbilt, and this is the place where this work took place. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the story of your COVID-19 emergency grant? What was that project? Absolutely. I uh, worked for Emily Towns, who uh, was the dean of the Divinity School at Vanderbilt. And Emily's uh, project was the Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative. I was hired on as the associate director and uh, hit the ground running in 2017 to establish community engagement so that we could do uh, theology and ethics from that vantage point. And so I built up a great deal of uh, community gravitas, if you will, uh, for the purpose of establishing that the ivory tower has to come down and out and into the community. And so it was uh, a natural thing for me because I've always been community organizer engaged. So I had plenty of friends on the ground, people who were doing good work, particularly around Stand Up Nashville, uh, efforts to, to bring in new things that would give people new opportunities and get them out of the doldrums. Well, when COVID-19 began to really hit cities, uh, Nashville was one in a number that immediately put these protocols in place. And the protocols were affecting greatly the people that I'd been working with. Their jobs were shutting down. They were having to go home with goo gobs of children, not knowing really how to manage uh, in-home education, lots and lots of issues. And more particularly, because some of them were what we called essential uh, personnel, it put the, the real impetus on how is it that you manage all these things. In, in terms of how they managed, they didn't. They needed help. And we found the Loose Foundation's efforts to really funnel some funds into the community to be a, a godsend. Uh, we had an immediate group of folk we could identify. We understood and knew what the needs were. We had folk who could get it to the homes. And that was impactful. But the piece that really um, just continues to wear on me and the place where we put a lot of our resources was the loss of two churches. And these churches were lost because um, about two weeks before the pandemic hit, as people say, and the protocols were invoked, a truly deadly tornado came through Nashville. And so these two exacerbating situations working together put the strain on uh, everybody. But uh, community leadership in worship and faith uh, really took a hard hit when their places of worship were, were totally destroyed. And so my ongoing work has been both to help heal in that context as well as to continue to have my feet on the ground with the people I made completely true relationality with. That's, um, that's, that's so powerful, and I feel like particularly with the two crises happening at once, right? The the natural disaster of a tornado and the pandemic, which people experienced in so many different ways. Um, can you can you describe a little bit more about like giving us some of the 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 color, or the detail to like who that community is? Like, who are some of these people that you're working with, um, and what were some of the experiences that that you shared with them? Oh, absolutely. And I, I can tell you that poverty is, is real in the North Nashville area, 27308 is the zip code. We know that because it's the most highly policed and highly uh, incarcerated area of Nashville proper. And it is a microcosm of what's going on all over the state, with Nashville being the only real blue city in a sea of red. Uh, you can imagine that policy is very difficult to come along unless the people come together. 
And I had seen the heart of the people because just a year before uh, this all happened, you know, we had such a, a great experience getting people mobilized to see to it that we had uh, police oversight. And so we knew that the heart of the people was with the, the, the folk who were downtrodden and oppressed. But what we didn't know is just how uh, engaged the, the sort of clerical community was. And so this was a test for that. And it gave me an opportunity to really build the kinds of relationships that matter. My own pastor, which was right around the street from one of these churches that was dis, uh, destroyed, my own pastor locked in the gear. We put together a triage. We had every resource you can think of come into our location. We served hot meals for two weeks straight every single day. We had uh, uh, tents outside where people could come and get respite. We even had uh, uh, places where they could do showers because some of them only had tarps over their homes. I mean, that's how much dis destruction was happening. And because of COVID, there was a need to really, really try and be sure that we're keeping people safe. And so, the, I mean, everybody that you can think of, I do mean everybody, came together, but we became the central location. And then, of course, we were able to really be uh, strategic in getting some of the CARES Act money to distribute. That was the first thing that I recall. The other thing that happened, though, is that these two pastors who lost their buildings kind of understood what, you know, what it meant to pivot. So we had to teach new skills, how to be a hybrid church, how to utilize technology, how to really uh, engage your people in a way that keeps them together until you can figure out whether or not you will ever come back to a building. That was challenging. But the other thing that we were able to do with some of the funds that we got from Loose was to, to uh, put monies in the hands of folk who, who work with children anyway to be able to create opportunities for them to have a space that kids could come to so that the parents could get a, a break. Because if you can imagine spending all day long at home with four children in your house and trying to work as well, that's uh, a pretty incredible thing. And so uh, we had one entity that, you know, with just a small amount of money, was able to keep students engaged, help them with their homework, show them new techniques on the computers. Oh, God, it was awesome. The other piece that really, really sticks out, and it is a piece that I've got lots and lots of pictures from and I've documented greatly and we still continue to uh, engage with, is that we realized that we had to make this money last, not just for the moment, but for as long as it could, it needed to be a gift that kept on giving. And so one of the churches, in addition to its property that had to be um, you know, bulldozed, they had another lot that wasn't being used for anything and we created the most beautiful Honestly, and I do mean the most beautiful community garden. Um, we had an artist donate renderings, and then a construction guy donated his services to create it based on the artist renderings. And uh, just last Sunday, they had another service in the, in the community garden where four churches came together. Four churches came together worshiping outside and thanking God for the harvest that was coming forth as a result of a planting that happened about a, a month ago. And so the community knows it's their garden. They can come there. We've seen people leave statements in the garden that says, I don't know what I would have uh, fed my kids had I not had these fresh veggies. Um, it's an amazing thing. It continues. Young people from uh, the area schools, and there are four of them right around, they come and they work in the dirt. They love it. And then right behind this garden is the elementary school. We're beginning to show uh, that elementary school how it can partner with us and bring children out to show what it's like. I've got pictures of little babies, like two years old, out there stirring it up, pulling out weeds, that kind of thing. It's a community effort that I never even saw coming. And now it's a living organism and it's something that is serving the people because it's a food desert they even say food apartheid because there is no real uh, place where you can go that you can buy fresh fruit or vegetables and now we've we've created that that's that's so beautiful there's there's so much that you're that you're sharing that I 
you know, it's, it's almost, it's making me emotional just thinking about how much uh, y'all have been able to accomplish. Um, but I think one of the things too that stands out is this idea of, of the pivot. It sounds like a lot of pivoting had to happen in a lot of places and in a lot of ways. Um, and so I'm wondering if you'd speak to, to one of those pivots that, that came on as a really, what was a big challenge that y'all then were able to pivot and turn into something beautiful? You've already mentioned a few, but mm. but are there any others that really stand out to you? Well, you know, how to handle property uh, once it has been destroyed is just not something that comes intuitively to people. So uh, the one person uh, who who's property we built the garden on just had no experience with that and so she had to pivot in a way that now is is giving her new life what do I mean well here's what she she's done uh, as a result of realizing that we can't come back where we were we've got to keep pressing forward this uh, wonderful pastor pastor Lisa Hammonds has now entered into Garrett Theological Seminary for a D-man, she will finish that D-man next year, and she has received um, a second concentration in how to do community organizing and executive management of nonprofit. I mean, to me, that is a signification of what hanging around academics might do, but also just understanding the need to uh, sort of reinvent, reinvent yourself to deal with, the, with the, the context of today. So now we've been able to ex explain to her through what we call our economic roundtable, because both of these pastors and several others around the state came together. It, through the economic roundtable, she's learned the importance of, of thinking about getting anchor tenants for a new building, because her congregation isn't big enough to build the building they had before. She's thinking now about how to partner with community uh, organizations that can give services the community truly needs, like uh, Vanderbilt Health System very well may be able to do a, we're hopeful, this is not something that has happened yet, but we're hopeful they could do a possible uh, clinic. Uh, we've, we've been talking to uh, a, a young group of uh, young people who started a, a farmer's market and thinking around how we could possibly do a uh, fresh vegetable uh, store. Nothing that would be overly priced or anything like that, but something that would give people the dignity of knowing they were going uh, you know, to an actual store and not you know, a, a dollar store, so to speak, places where they can't get uh, what they really need for nutrition. So that was a serious pivot. The other thing that happened, um, and, and I will tell you that I have just been amazed at what young people, how they come alive, some who were not involved in the church at all. Because this church really didn't have a, a population of what I would call young adults. She's had to pivot, and so has Jaquez Boyd, who was the other pastor. They both had to pivot to understand that whatever we come back as, we will have to do so in a way that keeps the attention of the folk who have actually come to help. And that's been an, an incredible uh, transformation for them. They've learned, both of these pastors have learned how to do uh, grant writing. So Dr. Um, Boyd has, has done enough to be able to get himself in a position to move forward. Uh, Pastor Hammonds, who will soon be Dr. Hammonds, um, has dispensed more than $650,000 to her community through learning how to do grant writing, getting CARES Act money, setting up a nonprofit, and issuing those checks that kept people in their mortgages, their lights, and their water. It's it's so incredible, and I can I can see the excitement and passion in your face as you're talking about this, and then um, in your earlier description too, you were kind of talking about how this work is continuing and it mm -hmm. seems like there's still a lot of momentum that you know as we kind of move out of this time of the pandemic mm -hmm. maybe where some of this began um, whatever that may mean mm -hmm. um, that there's still work to be done so I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about so like how has the project grown and mm -hmm. how is it um, inspiring or kind of mm -hmm. you know helping you think through what you're currently working on 
So as you well know, I have a teaching position way away from, from Nashville, but I still work together with Emily uh, in a project we call Towards Our Common Public Life. And I'm very interested in two things. I want to be able to do some things for those pastors because working through a pandemic, keeping your people together, hoping and praying that something will change, that you'll be able to get them back to where they were or move them forward, uh, takes a lot out of you. So I want to do some, some work to help renew them, to bring them into a place where they're no longer feeling as though, you know, all of the, they're not Atlas. So the whole world shouldn't be on their shoulders, so to speak. That's the first thing. The other thing I'd like to do is begin to show um, other pastors the work that we've done with them and then allow them to become the leaders in that community. I can watch, not so much watch, but certainly not be as hands-on and then move on into Gettysburg where a lot of people are still on life support there as well to kind of re reinvent that same process. Because I don't even have a church to, to worship in. The one that's there is on life support. It needs, it needs that engagement again. And so one of the things that I'm hopeful to do is, as I, I said, uh, find some funds to really do uh, pastoral renewal, give them a shot in the arm, so to speak, and then teach them to do the things we've taught them with other pastors. That's what I'm interested in having happen. Yeah, that, that looking towards a sustainability and continuation seems really, really necessary, particularly mm -hmm. in, in so many different communities right now. Um, we've still got a little bit more time to keep talking, and so I want to, you know, ask you to kind of think back on, on your personal experience and just as this scholar who found themselves in this place of kind of doing some of this work, what advice would you have for somebody else who might stumble into this kind of situation, working with different community members? What are some lessons you mm -hmm. learned along the way? So uh, the way things unfolded with me might be slightly different from a lot of everyone else in the network. And because we did have a lot of things already going on with the community, it was understandable. But uh, looking back on this, I would uh, hope and, and, you know, pray that um, I would have a different way to dispense the funds, uh, find some new process engineering, if you will, because I find institutions are a little hard to bend when it comes to dealing with the community. And I was not at all pleased with the way Vanderbilt tried basically to take credit for something Luce was doing. Now, I don't say that to disparage them. It's just a question of process engineering and the ability for us to create the kinds of uh, atmospheres that really appreciates the need to break down uh, those barriers as opposed to continue to build them up. Institutions have a bad, bad rap, but they, they earned it. And so we need to break that down by having community relationships that don't have to jump through so many hoops. The other thing is, and this is something I did and I think I did well, but I would say to other people who are who are called upon to do this work, document, 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 which is why I so appreciate the work you and Chris are doing. I, I just cannot tell you how important it is to create uh, archives. Uh, and we did a showing of our two documentaries, 30 minutes apiece, of these pastors, what they went through, what they experienced. And we did a, a launch or what you call a viewing uh, with the whole community. More than 100 people came. That when they watched it, there wasn't a dry eye in the building. You know, because first of all, they couldn't even re recall some of the things they'd said, how things looked, what it was all about. But then they had this document. And uh, Dr. Uh, Boyd uh, says that his people were just, they felt dignified that somebody cared about their story. And Reverend Hammonds, uh, you know, in the, in the film itself, she talks about how the community really comforted her. Those two things, I think, helped everybody see something totally different about what this work can be. It was transformative. Um, yeah, I feel like that moment of transformation is really important. And I'm also, you, you have me thinking about kind of your own journey, because again, you were talking about um, you know, how you kind of came from a place where you already had these deep-rooted connections. And doing community-based work, right, that's, 
that is the key, right? You have to have those relationships. You have to have those things. And so it's, it is difficult. There's no single how-to of how to develop those relationships. But where do you think some of that started for you? What did the beginning of that relationship building look like, even if it was long before this project? Mm, that's, a, that's a question I haven't really reflected on much. But I can tell you that part of it is just being open to, to being relational. Uh, I find in the world, it doesn't matter if someone has a swastika on their on their shoulder. You know, I can talk to you. I can just have a conversation. And before it's all said and done, we'll find something that brings the commonality out. And before that's said and done, we might even find that we'd like some things together. And in the process of it all, those divisions break down. It doesn't mean that you leave there ready to go and get the swastika taken off your shoulder. But what it does mean is that I have a different understanding of somebody who wears one, and so do you. And so I think I live life that way, but I really learned a lot of it from just uh, knowing it was my job to start with. Then not going in trying to act like I know everything. I went into the meetings of NOAA, which is uh, Nashville Organized for Community uh, Action and Hope. I went into that meeting saying, I just want to put my hands together on the plow with you. Not, I'm a public theologian. Not, I just got a PhD. Not, I had a 20-year history of practicing law. None of that. Just, what can I do? And I showed up. I showed up in the rain. I showed up in the little bit of sleep we used to get. <laughs> but I was dependable. And more than anything, people saw me as a part of the community, not some outsider. That's because I was intentional about posturing myself that way. Yeah, um, that's that's so important. And I think that that's, um, that's really beautiful. And, and it's simple on some levels, right? You showed up, but you had that commitment and that dedication. Um, we've got just a couple more minutes. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity, if there's anything else you'd like to say um, about your project, mm -hmm. um, what, what would you like that to be? You know, we're thinking about that archive. What do you hope people kind of down the road know and remember about this work? Well, particularly as I think about the institutions that both of those pastors come from, the Baptist Church and its history in America, in North America, um, and then the African Methodist Episcopal Church. You know, these are church networks. They are huge. Just that documentary being shown at a place where, you know, thousands and thousands of people come to have conferences, I, I think could really make a difference in, in terms of how people change their minds away from just being these ecclesial elites to folk who put, get their hands dirty. That's one. The second thing for me is I am an academic. I enjoy theory. I enjoy the theoretical. I enjoy reading, I enjoy writing, but most of all, I enjoy that whatever it is I do along those lines has application in the place where I live. Yeah, that resonates with me as well. Um, well, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me today. Um, I think that's all we have time for.